And in 10, Scott Cawthon. Apparently a lot of people think that after Scott retired, Steel Wool ended up getting the copyright to FNAF, but this couldn't be further from the truth. As you can see on the announcement as well as any image of the logo for this delivery service, it does maintain that FNAF and all of its components are still under the copyright of Scott Cawthon. Virtual Dining Concepts website even says that it partnered with Scott and not anybody else in order to make this delivery service come to life. So yeah, I mean there's not much else to say about this, okay, but Scott is the only person on the FNAF side, at least as far as we know currently, that is involved in the process. Mr. Beast isn't involved, Steel Wool seemingly isn't involved since they haven't mentioned it at all since they only make money off of security breach and help wanted. So yeah, okay, Scott is still the copyright owner and owner of the series and I'm pretty sure that even for the next part of the series it will remain that way. He may not be involved that much, but whoever the series is handed off to won't have the copyright or the ownership, it will just be stuff that is pre-approved by Scott. And at 9, it's real, okay? A lot of people couldn't tell if I was being serious or not in the shorts, okay? And I guarantee you that this is actually real. This isn't something I'm making up, it's not a hoax, it's actually a thing. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza is real, or well, is going to be kind of, because of the company that made Mr. Beast Burger possible, called Virtual Dining Concepts, they did announce that they partnered with Scott Cawthon to take the first ever fictional video game setting and turn it into a real life delivery restaurant, okay? Emphasis on the delivery part on that, however, because I cannot stress this enough, there is no actual location that you can walk into. I'm going to be saying this a lot in this video, okay, because seemingly no matter how many times I say it, nobody gets it, there is no actual location, okay, I leave a pinned comment on the short and nobody reads it. People even replying to that comment that said there was no physical location asking where it was going to be built. Guys, it's really happening, okay? You'll be able to order it, but you can only order it online through food delivery apps, just like how they handle Mr. Beast Burger, okay? I just hope that this stuff is actually seasoned, okay? I may be white, but I do have taste buds. In at eight, Twitter. There isn't really a lot of new information since we last updated you in the previous short on the subject, the, the second one, not the first one. However, the restaurants still have an official Twitter account known as at F Fazbear's Pizza, and based on their account details, they've actually been planning this since January of last year at least, considering that that's when the account joined. You can also sign up for email and text reminders on their website, freddyfazbearspizza.com, and they've been responding to quite a few people on Twitter, but not me, unfortunately. It's kind of annoying, really. But they also haven't sent out any text reminders since the, the last video as well. Like, I signed up for text reminders, haven't gotten one, which really makes me believe that this was only meant to kind of course correct since the announcement came early thanks to the tweet that had the leak that blew up. Okay. Virtual Dining Concepts really needed to make sure that their website didn't have the information about upcoming projects available for just anyone to see, especially when the fan base surrounding the delivery service is as intense as this one. This may have sprung up thanks to people searching for ARG clues in the wake of Matt Pat's last FNAF theory video about the Fast Bear Frights books before he released his Please Stop video, which in my mind is the most likely scenario of how this was found, but since the account hasn't tweeted in a week now, I'm pretty sure it was just made public. So that they might as well like lean into the fact that we already knew about it, so yeah. In its seven menu, we don't currently have a proper menu for the fast bear service yet, but currently what we know is that according to Virtual Dining Concepts website, quote, the easy to execute menu features craveable pizza rolls with a unique twist and game tie-ins that new and current fans will want to order over and over again. Now whether the unique twist is death or a special topping is one thing, however I'm pretty sure that we can all guess they'll also be serving pizza with a variety of customizable toppings, especially according to their Twitter, uh, since they did ask what our favorite pizza topping was in a tweet. I'm disappointed that there weren't more favorite pizza place jokes in there uh, in those replies. However, based on the comments on our first short on the subject, there are going to be some scary replies to that tweet as well, because it's Twitter. Luckily, I don't think they'll be adding fingers to the meat add-ons. We can also guess that they'll be serving similar stuff to like a normal Chuck E. Cheese or a pizza place, so soda, cheese, chicken as well, because chica I'm guessing, uh, mini brownies, and probably a small variety of desserts. They may even have cake, because it's supposed to be a place you can go for your birthday. Which I, I think would make the most sense, but only if the kitchen that ends up taking on this additional menu would also normally make cake. And at 6, no relation. Xblue is a YouTube group that has been working on making multiple FNAF locations real. They've done FNAF 4, and recently seemingly completed a recreation of FNAF 1, despite their channel description saying in progress 
progress, but their video saying that it's done. So maybe they're adding the finishing touches right now. The YouTube channel, to my knowledge, has no affiliation with Virtual Dining Concepts or Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Delivery. However, their videos are incredibly cool and interesting, so if you want to see their rendition of a real FNAF, go check them out on YouTube, okay? I'm sure that if you're this deep into the FNAF algorithm, you've already seen it, but I might as well point you in their direction anyway, okay? Go subscribe to them. They're, they're, they're pretty cool. However, uh, they do not have any relation to Virtual Dining Concepts or this delivery service, as far as I know, okay? There also is no real location for this delivery service to operate from, again. So, their videos have nothing to do with this announcement. Honestly, the announcement seems like it was rushed, again, because we ended up finding out, thanks to the website having the information, and then everyone started tweeting about it. But we were like, actually, we were two days late to the party on that short. By the way, that was a whole other thing that was two days before and I was like, oh, we should probably release a short. And besides, if they were affiliated, wouldn't they have made the FNAF 1 location first instead of second after FNAF 4? Or wouldn't they just have not posted it on YouTube because, you know, NDAs, legal stuff, Scott loving the element of surprise. Yeah, I'd think so too. Halfway through into number 5, Twitter hoax. The Twitter account of Diamond Zia on June 27, 2020 tweeted out three photos with the line of FNAF will be real in 48 hours. These pictures were of news articles. One from the USA Today titled Five Children Have Gone Missing Inside Chuck E. Cheese. Parents Report Smells Coming dot dot dot. One from the Associated Press called Post Hour Worker at Chuck E. Cheese Reported Dead at 27. And a final one from Something News titled Night Shift Workers at Chuck E. Cheese's Claims Strange Movements from Animatronics During Post Hours. However, this title had animatronics spelt incorrectly. It said animatronics. <laughs> Everyone was freaking out at these pictures of the articles, okay, particularly the first one, and they were shared all over the internet. Okay? People were losing their minds, especially because this was around the time where Chuck E. Cheese was closing. However, people didn't realize that these were fake, okay? How are they fake, you ask? Simple source code editing. Well, okay, it's simple to me because I know how to do it, but if you don't know, it may seem complicated. But in reality, you can change what anything says on a, any website, but it will only change for you until you reload the page. By by editing the source code. All you need to do is like find the aspect that you're looking for after you right click and click inspect. Yeah, like especially on Google Chrome, it's easy. Once you do that, like once you find the aspect, you can change it to whatever you want. You can change pictures, you can change titles, you can do whatever. So whoever made the original image had found an article potentially already about Chuck E. Cheese closing from USA Today and then changed the title to Five Children Go Missing. And the same thing with the other articles. Hence why there were only images of the articles and not the actual links, okay? It was a hoax that blew up and people actually believed it and some still do and something that's related to this restaurant, but it's not, okay? That, that was all fake and plus that was two years ago, all right? There, there's no relation between those at all. In it for no animatronics. Guys, I cannot stress this enough. There is no actual location, meaning that there won't be any animatronics that you can meet unless your Uber Eats driver wants to go the extra mile and for some reason has a spare FNAF costume laying in his trunk or in his backpack. I, I don't really think it's going to happen. And you know what? If they do have a spare one, that's going to be questionable. <laughs> Obviously, things can change. Like, they may have a uniform or something to give to the drivers, but I can pretty much guarantee that that's not going to happen. Okay, especially not like that. Okay, if Mr. Beast even doesn't do that with Mr. Beast Burger and it's Mr. Beast, I don't think that they're going to be doing it for anyone else. Okay, sorry guys, but you won't be meeting any actual animatronics unless some seriously hardcore drivers go all out or there's some secret ARG element that Scott plans on including that we have no idea about. Okay, but also, that's not me saying that there is an ARG. I don't fully believe that there is, but the appearance of a Freddy Fazbear's delivery service after the community had been told uh, that no non official business would participate is very sus in my opinion, okay? Scott is a sussy baka, all aboard the sus bus. Plus, uh, it's said that the pizza rolls are gonna have game tie-ins. So, unless that's like a name, that's additionally sus. Dude, it's like I, it's, uh, it's like I'm seeing this delivery service vent all over, all over scaled. And in three therapy, some of these comments make me really think that there should be a group fund for FNAF fan therapy sessions because, dear lord, I make a lot of jokes, okay? But like, I hope that these comments are jokes or supposed to be funny because, um, fingers as toppings. You want to watch the bite of 83 or 87? What the actual? F 
The comments on our first short about this delivery service, ignore me pronouncing first wrong, are very concerning if anything is supposed to be real. Okay, this is a part of why Scott kept saying that he wasn't going to make a real FNAF. And I think that this is like the best way that he could compromise to make it happen for the people who were good and wanted it instead of, you know, the people like this. Like, why would he want to make an actual location if people keep commenting stuff like this? Seriously, I feel genuine concern for you if you're being serious about wanting to possess an animatronic. Yeah, be a fan of the series and love the series as much as you want. Don't sacrifice your life to try to make the series real. Okay, that's not a good thing. Look at all the bad things that happened in the series. Plus, possession isn't real. Especially in the same way that FNAF's possession works, okay? That's entirely fictional. And besides, there is no actual FNAF restaurant or location for you to go to anyway. So please, stop commenting it, at least on our videos, so I don't have to see it. Ignorance is truly bliss. And ultimately, in at number two, no Mr. Beast. I've seen a load of comments about people saying, why would Mr. Beast do this? Or making jokes like Mr. Beast is gonna do a whoever kills five kids first gets a million dollars video. But Mr. Beast has no affiliation with virtual dining concepts, which is the company making this delivery service possible, okay? Mr. Beast doesn't own it. He doesn't have any stake in it from what I know. He has nothing to do with Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Delivery. I don't want there to be any issues that come up because people think that he is affiliated with this, okay? Jimmy has nothing to do with Freddy's. He only has affiliation with Mr. Beast Burger, which was also made possible by Virtual Dining Concepts. Me introducing it like that was just that you know that it was real. The company that made Mr. Beast Burger possible also is making FNAF possible. The two aren't related, except th just because the company made both happen. I don't know if that makes you disappointed or happy about it, but there is no connection to Mr. Beast whatsoever unless they end up sponsoring him for a video so that they can like get the word out even more or so that he can make like a version of the restaurant for a video and invite FNAF tubers or FNAF fans over for a chance to win it in a similar fashion to how he invited people over to win a chocolate factory. But even if that video does happen, it will only be a sponsorship deal and not an actual partnership, okay? It's like just like when YouTubers get sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, okay? They're, 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 it's just the sponsor. We don't have any stake in, in, in Raid, okay? Okay, it, it was it would only be a sponsorship deal. Okay, and the location that he would make wouldn't actually be a restaurant. It would only be used for that video, and then it would be dismantled. Possibly even in the same place that he built the chocolate factory, assuming that he's renting like that unit or owns it. And finally, in a number one delivery service, I cannot emphasize this enough. Okay, I saw a lot of people commenting saying that there is a real location finally, or asking where it is, or why would they do that. It, it's not that kind of restaurant. It's not a restaurant, it's a delivery service. Just like how you can't actually walk into a Mr. Beast Burger, there will be no physical location for you to visit. The whole point of virtual dining concepts is that existing kitchens have the ability to, to make these and they can opt in, turning them into outlets for these recipes. Like when you order a Mr. Beast Burger, there is no actual Mr. Beast Burger restaurant. It's something that like a Wendy's or something is like making the food either in their kitchen or in a food truck on their property, but you can't actually like go up to that food truck and order. It will be the same concept for this place, okay, but with places that already serve these kinds of food. As it says on the Virtual Dining Concepts website, quote, don't change who you are. We have brands that fit your current kitchen, suppliers, and way of working. So, there is and most likely will not be a real Freddy Fazbear's unless Scott intends to make it like a two-week special location in the future for potential lore or whatever, okay? But there is none at the moment, and there won't be when this launches. You just order this on food delivery apps, okay? No. And at 10, Brian Wells. This is certainly an interesting case that you may not really think relates to William, but let me explain my thought process. Brian Douglas Wells was an American pizza delivery driver who was killed during a complex bank robbery plot. The plot involved a collar bomb, a scavenger hunt, the robbery itself, and a pizza delivery man. Following an attempt to rob PNC Bank, Wells was surrounded by police. That's when the bomb around his neck ended up detonating, killing him. And while his family denies that he was a part of it, investigators and a federal prosecutor concluded that Wells was a knowing participant in the bank robbery. However, he was told that the bomb was fake and he did not know that his co-conspirators intended for him to die. Now, I think that it was probably detonated because he got caught and they didn't want him to rat on them and that is the prevailing theory amongst these people as well. Against amongst the prosecutor and whatnot, but aside from being a pizza delivery man for Mamma Mia's Pizzeria, what possible connection could he have to Afton? Well, being killed by a device that was supposed to be safe, 
for one, the spring locking and the collar, being betrayed by your peers, in William's case most likely Henry, and the affinity for complex plans. I feel like this may have been at least a slight source of inspiration, especially since this came up when I searched for pizza place serial killers, um, because I was hoping that there would be one. Um, uh, that's weird to say. Um, <laughs> let's just... Let's just move on. And at nine, Andrew Cunanan. Andrew Cunanan was born in San Diego, California and eventually settled in San Francisco's Castro District and socialized with older, wealthy gay men while indulging heavily in illicit substances. It's unclear what set him off, but he began a cross-country killing spree of five unknown victims, the last of which was actually fashion designer Gianni Versace. Cunanan killed himself on a Miami boathouse in 1997, and if that didn't set off an alarm, uh, congratulations, you have not been ruined by FNAF yet. However, William Afton also had five victims at least, but definitely only had five when FNAF 1 and even around FNAF 2 was released. And while FNAF 1 does take place in 1993, many have theorized it to instead take place in 1997, which is unlikely given the minimum wage of the times and the connection to another real person, but nonetheless, it's certainly an interesting case of more possible dates lining up and the same number of victims. You know, a lot of people on this list are actually going to have five victims, and it's extremely creepy. In at 8, Nathan Dunlap. In December of 1993, after Chuck E. Cheese had closed in Aurora, Colorado, Margaret Kohlberg, who was the manager of this Chuck E. Cheese, was tallying receipts in the back room. While she was doing that, Bobby Stevens was scrubbing down the kitchen, and Ben Grant, Colleen O'Connor, and Sylvia Crawwell were all working in the main party area. However, there was someone hiding in the bathroom, 19-year-old Nathan Dunlap, who earlier that year had begun working as a cook, but was fired after an argument over his hours. But this time, he was looking for revenge. He exited the bathroom and began firing, killing everyone in the building. First Sylvia, then Ben, then Colleen, then he went into the kitchen where he shot Bobby, although Bobby ended up surviving and was actually a key witness in his case. Then Nathan went to the back room, where Margaret opened the safe before being shot twice. Nathan filled her bag with $1,500 cash, arcade tokens, and keychains, but thanks to the security cameras, he was promptly arrested and sentenced to death. Thanks to MatPat and his first game theory on FNAF, this one is fairly well known, hence why it's closer to the top, but if I didn't include it, I feel like everyone in the comments would have asked me why, so there you go. And it's seven Burke and Hare. The Burke and Hare murders were 16 serial killings committed over a period of about 10 months in 1828 in Edinburgh, Scotland. The two men who committed these killings, last names Burke and Hare, were doing it because they also sold the corpses to Robert Knox for dissection at his anatomy lectures. There was actually a shortage of corpses in Edinburgh, and thus people actually started grave robbing and selling the corpses rather than selling the possessions. Since a loophole in the system only considered it a theft if the body was taken with its clothes. Naked corpses were fine to take though, apparently. They didn't really think that one through. These two were killing in the name of science, something that we suspect William was doing as well. However, they actually were in a messed up way contributing to the furthering of science, whereas William is only doing it for his own selfish reasons reasons and to become immortal. After Hare was given immunity to confess to the murders so that they could convict Burke, Burke was sentenced to death. Shortly afterwards, his corpse was dissected and his skeleton was displayed at the Anatomical Museum of Edinburgh Medical School, where, as of 2021, it actually still remains. Oh, and by the way, the reason they're known as Burke and Hare was because both of their first names are William. Yeah. So maybe Afton's wife is named something similar. And at 6, Ted Bundy. During an interview with Daco, PJ Haywood, the voice actor for William Afton in Sister Location, FNAF AR, and Ultimate Custom Night, said that Scott Cawthon described William as being a charismatic, smooth-talking snake oil salesman, which coincides with Book William being able to convince anyone of anything. This is actually very similar to how Ted Bundy had been described. Bundy was regarded as charismatic and handsome, traits that he exploited to win the trust of both his victims and society as a whole. He would typically approach his victims in public places, either feigning a physical impairment such as an injury or impersonating an authority figure before bludgeoning them until they were unconscious. While he did operate nearly a decade before Afton started his spree, those are merely just like year numbers. But one of the most interesting facts, however, is that in 1975, Bundy was arrested and jailed in Utah 
for aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault in Utah, where the games and the crimes of Afton take place. Halfway through in number five, Arthur Gary Bishop. Arthur Gary Bishop was an American serial killer in 1983, and as a result of a routine police investigation, he confessed to the murders of five young boys between 1979 and 1983. Bishop was born in Hinckley, Utah, and was the eldest of six brothers. Bishop was raised as a devout Latter day Saint, Mormon, and was an Eagle Scout and an honor student, which is already suspicious in comparison to Afton, given that Afton was also regarded as intelligent given his talent for animatronics, especially in the 80s, and his passion for business. But not only that, Bishop also operated under an alias. Bishop was arrested for embezzlement in February of 1978 and given a five year suspended sentence, but he skipped his parole and fled to Salt Lake City, living under the alias of Roger Downs. Under this alias, Bishop would then kill five boys between 1979 and 1983. It's also interesting that multiple key dates in Bishop's life line up closely to releases of FNAF games. On July 14, 1993, he was arrested, and FNAF 4 came out on July 23rd, nine days after that. Well, not in the same year, but you know what I mean. Bishop's first kill was on October 14th, 1979, and Sister Location was released on October 7th. I mean, it's not concrete, but it's certainly interesting. Plus, also, he was caught in 1983, the same year that Crying Child was bit. In at four, Donald Harvey. Harvey belonged to a group of psychos known as the Angels of Mercy who claimed to kill for the benefit of the victim. Harvey was convicted of 37 of his more than 57 suspected murders, and he confessed to as many as 87. When Harvey was hired at the Cincinnati VA Medical Hospital, he managed to collect over 30 pounds of cyanide which he had kept in his home. He also kept diaries and detailed notes on each one of his victims, including how he killed them. That gives me just that, that's intense William Afton vibes. Like, not not for some certain reasons, but the delusion of him thinking that he was doing it for the benefit of the victims or just for any benefit uh, is still, is, it's horrifying, okay? It's the exact same kind of delusion that I could see William having. And a similar delusion to what he seems to have in the games. In the books, he's not exactly like this from my memory, but the game version certainly seems to be the type, okay? Especially given his appearance in the Foxy Go 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 minigame where he's smiling. Getting close to the end in number three, Thomas Lee Dillon. Thomas Lee Dillon was a serial sniper found guilty of killing five men, again, with the five. Directed by voices in his head, Dillon killed people randomly. According to attending psychiatrists, Dillon's delusions of grandeur spilled over into the reality of his life and the lives of his victims. His victims were killed by a high-powered rifle while they participated in outdoor activities, sometimes hundreds of miles from Dillon's home. Authorities did not link the killings to Dillon until he actually sent a letter to a local paper. After the FBI I put together a criminal profile of the killer, a friend of Dylan's actually brought into the attention of the authorities, which in my mind is very close to the story of William Afton. The amount of victims, the authorities only investigating those murders after they got tipped off by a friend of the killer, in Afton's case that being Henry, the delusions or the voices in his head could be him being possessed. But honestly, a whole load of these people are just so much like William, it's terrifying. And ultimately in at number two, John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy, as I'm sure you know, was an American serial killer who killed 33 young men and boys. Gacy regularly performed at children's hospitals and charitable events as Pogo or Patches the Clown, personas that he had devised. He became known as the killer clown due to his public services as a clown prior to the discovery of these crimes, but jeez. Gacy committed all of the crimes inside of his ranch house, which is a horrible idea, just like William killing inside of his own pizzeria. Typically, he would lure a victim to his home and then dupe them into donning handcuffs on the pretext of demonstrating a magic trick. And while this is absolutely disgusting and really makes me sick to my stomach, there are still a few similarities to Afton. Okay, killing in a place related to you, for Gacy it was his ranch house, and for Afton it's his business. The target demographic is also the same with young people, although Afton also killed girls, um, which I don't, I don't even want. Ugh. And while you may think that this is a stretch, uh, even FNAF itself made the connection with FNAF AR through the clown spring trap skin. Um, intentional or not, that, come on, that's, that's a, that's a connection. 
And finally, in at number one, Robert Berdella. Robert Berdella is, to me, the seemingly perfect inspiration for William Afton. Not only did this man own his own business called Bob's Bizarre Bazaar, where he reportedly sold human skulls, but he also seemingly started his killing spree in 1984. The MO is certainly not the same. Uh, Berdella would drug and kidnap men that he met in bars and on the streets, but the same idea of killing people you meet in a restaurant scene is carried over to William. There is no confirmed inspiration for William, hence this list, but there are certainly a decent amount of similarities between these two. In fact, if you combine like all the serial killers we talked about on this list, especially these last four, you'll basically get a real William Afton, and I don't like that, okay? That's horrifying. But again, that was the point of this list, so it was a way for me to talk about FNAF without having to talk about FNAF, okay? I didn't go into too much detail with these because, well, I I'm sure you can guess why, um, but yeah. Either way, I think that this is a, a pretty... The, the, the similarities are scary. That's all I have to say. In a tense, Scrap Baby. Scrap Baby is a creepy animatronic. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Okay, Scrap Baby is by far creepier than the normal baby animatronic because, I mean, it, it, it's scrapped. So, this costume certainly does not justice. Animatronics are a difficult costume to really make, okay? I mean, it, it's understandable because, you know, we're, we're people and unfortunately don't have robotic limbs for the most part. Or if we do, we typically try and make it look like a real leg instead of a robot leg, but uh, uh, scrap Baby is even more difficult because, you know, it, it's a scrap animatronic and it has a giant freaking claw. Um, so yeah, Scrap Baby is very damaged and it's a recycled version of Baby, okay? Realistic reddish, orange, light blue hair, yellow pigtails. It, it's weird, alright? It's weird, okay? She she has an orange top with red furls and it, it, it's very damaged. Yet somehow Instagram user Gaia Spaziani was able to recreate this in an awesome way, okay? So very well done and maybe you can use it as inspiration inspiration for yourself. In at 9, Spring Trap. <laughs> oh boy. Craftix Gaming's YouTube channel features a video of a real Spring Trap costume and honestly, it's terrifying. Spring Trap is the main antagonist of FNAF 3 and this costume is freaking nuts, okay? This, this is a very good costume and while Spring Trap may not be the scariest animatronic per se, uh, he's not someone that I'm gonna tussle with, you know? However, I do, I do want to talk about what's going on with this character because my guy, you just dressed up as a possessed man who who is inhabiting an animatronic unable to die but yet still somehow decaying. I don't I don't get it. You're quite literally dressing up as a serial killer at this point. Like in in the FNAF world, if you dressed up like this, it, it would be you dressed up as like Ted Bundy. It was like an equivalent in this world, okay? So, if you want to be in FNAF that badly, maybe don't dress as a serial killer is all I'm saying, okay? I know that's ironic coming from me, um given that I wear a purple shirt on the regular, but do I look like I want to be in FNAF? No. I cry about it on the daily. I have made things very clear that I, I don't want to be in this world, and if you don't know that, go watch more videos, okay? Uh, but this, this, this is nuts, okay? That, that's insane, and if Springtrap was delivering me my pizza, I probably would cry. In at 8, Ennard. Costumes don't really have to be elaborate to be scary, okay? Take this for example. This Ennard cosplay by the YouTube channel Skywarped33. This entire endoskeleton, like spaghetti bits, they aren't there, but the lights and sounds make it even more frightening than you'd think, okay? The face also opens up, and I think that we all know how I feel about animatronics who can move their face at will, or at least move their face in separate sections, okay? It's not something that should be allowed. However, even without all the parts and the, the various eyes, this entered cosplay is not something that I would want to run into in a dark alley. Especially not after that goddamn vent repair minigame, because that caused me to have serious issues, okay? I used to like spaghetti, man, okay? Now, now what What do I do? I won't be ordering spaghetti from this delivery service, that's for damn sure, although if they do have entered spaghetti on the menu, I might have to. Uh, but no, 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 okay? Especially if the driver shows up wearing this, because holy crap, um, that would be terrifying, and I would rather die than see a real life entered. Um, so yeah, maybe actually don't do this. At least if you're delivering to me. And it's Seven Vanny. With Vanny being the villain uh, in the last game, and already one of the most popular characters in the entire series, I know that she's not an animatronic, okay, but chill. There are bound to be plenty of costumes of the character. However, this specific one from Rogito Ubu on Twitter is probably the most accurate and creepiest one I've seen. And yes, I said Ubu with a straight face, and let's ignore it. Vanny being a 
Plankton follower does in a way technically make this also a glitch trap cosplay as well. We, we, we won't talk about it because that, that's not what counts unless you want to consider glitch trap an animatronic, in which case it's totally fine if you want to think that. This costume is probably the most realistic one on this list because, well, I mean, Vanny in the games ended up making her own suit and it's just a human inside, uh, whereas the others like Scrap Baby or Spring Trap are animatronics as well as being part human, be it soul or another body. Um, and Regina's costume actually follows the exact same concept. It's just a person who makes their own suit, which potentially makes this the scariest thing of all. Um, but honestly, considering how she is currently the serial killer in the series, at least uh, the version that actually has like proper working limbs, I would very much appreciate not seeing a real Vanny delivering me my pizza balls. No thanks. And it's six nightmare. I've said it before and I will say it again. Nightmare is the scariest animatronic from these games, hands down. Get it? Because I put my hands down. This guy will get me every time, and it's one of the reasons that I refuse to play FNAF 4. The other one is, is Nightmare Fredbear, okay? But at least I don't have to really deal with them in real life, right? Oh wait, yeah, just talked about it. This is only like a nightmare character created in the mind of a coma patient in a video game, but it is still the worst thing ever. Especially thanks to Zomb Bunny Creations on Amino Apps, okay? We, we've got both Nightmare and Nightmare Fredbear. Ironically enough, Nightmare Fredbear is played by their twin sister. It's ironic because Elizabeth Apton is sometimes presumed to be Crying Child's twin sister. And it, anyway, these absolute hulking costumes are going to make me, let, let, let's say, drop a, a Snickers bar in my pants. If I saw this in real life, Jesus, imagine like actually like living in a house that's kind of laid out like the one from FNAF. Four, and then like your kids want to play a prank on you and then they dress in these and they come from either side for God's sakes I would actually rather die if that is what's going to happen I do not want kids my grandparents house is kind of laid out like that um, Like not exactly but it has like two sections of like I on either side of the room Okay, so that could theoretically be reenacted and if that ever happens I'm going to cry so if you start delivering my pizza dressed as nightmare uh, actually good for you <laughs> Halfway through in at number five nightmare Freddy Nightmare Freddy is one of the most iconic versions of the Freddy character, even if there are only three games that feature them, those being FNAF 4, Ultimate Custom Night, and FNAF VR. However, this Nightmare Freddy cosplay is absolutely insane, and in my opinion, it, it would have been the front runner for the uh, Coupe de France cosplay competition, but that was back in 2017. The video was uploaded by YouTube channel Gorgon Geek, and this guy plays the robot thing very well, uh, but as soon as he drops that microphone, he goes into like terror mode, which is certainly something to behold, okay? I would have enjoyed it if he had the frettles with him, uh, but the moving mouth is certainly a nice touch on this costume, especially with the attempted jump scares that they do in the video, like the Bleh. Imagine if this guy got up on stage in a freaking Nightmare Freddy costume and then just started twerking. That that would have won them the gold, okay? I don't know if they won or not, but that if they if they had it, that's, that's what would have gotten you the gold, okay? But also, if Nightmare Freddy was the one delivering me my pizza, I don't think that I would actually end up eating it, uh, just from just sh sheer fear that they would have poisoned it uh, or, or maybe you put too many chili flakes on it I mean like come on look at me in it for Buff Helpy. Okay, so this may not be like a cosplay or a costume that someone could reasonably wear, but Buff Helpy is probably the most disturbing non-cosplay character that I can really include on this list. If you don't already know, somehow, Buff Helpy is a meme that was created on a Daco FNAF meme review video and has ever since been haunting him and the rest of the community. Okay, don't get me wrong, I do love Helpy, but this Buff Helpy meme generated a whole load of Buff FNAF character ideas that now terrify me. Nowhere is safe from these horrific creations. If you look up any character, you're bound to find a buff version of them at some point. It's kind of like those games where it's like, let's search up a character and see how long it takes them to be sexualized, and then they scroll down. Do that with a FNAF character, but see yeah, how fast it makes them buff, okay? It's the same thing that happens to Chica, but buff, okay? No matter what this is, like what form of psychological torment this is, I would not wish it on my worst enemy. However, I'm talking about it because, you know what? It's hilarious. If Buff Helpy showed up delivering my pizza, I would constantly order from this place. Not because I want to see some like buff shirtless dude in a Helpy mask actually handing my food, but because that is the most genius marketing ploy ever, and I would be very proud of them. In at three, Withered Bonnie. This Withered Bonnie cosplay is probably one of the scariest FNAF cosplays I've seen, and the scariest Bonnie cosplay. It is incredible that that. 
someone could actually do this and it comes from the YouTube user The Nick of Time. At first I legitimately thought that this was CGI instead of an actual costume but lo and behold it was just an insanely cool costume. Glowing eyes, seemingly actual aluminum parts and a chest that opens that you can push out with the other hand which results in actually quite the decent jump scare. Okay, Frankly in the video I was kind of taken aback by that so you know what if that's where my pizza came out of I don't know if I would take it. This kind of thing always impresses the hell out of me because like so far the closest I've come to making a full costume was when I helped someone work on a costume, okay? But that, that's the closest I've got and I can not even think to make something like this. So if you show up and my pizza pops out of like your abdomen ch chest area, I'm gonna tip you 100%, that's insane. But ultimately in number two, Glitch Trap. We know my issue with Glitch Trap, all right? We know that I just wanna watch William Afton burn in the deepest pits of hell and then leave me be. I want him to be in actual hell and then stay there for all of eternity so that I can move on with my life, okay? I hate this, I always come back thing that he's got going on, okay? It's stupid. And despite being dressed as the purple guy on various occasions, I still want William dead. So, when I saw this frighteningly realistic looking glitch trap costume, uh, my nerves hit an all time high. I think the sheer simplicity of a glitch trap suit is definitely something that makes this a hell of a creepy costume since, you know, the stitches here are very accentuated. It's very clear it made for the higher, it has higher contrast than the actual suit in the game, but either way, it's freaking creepy. And if, if the if a serial killer is going to hand me my pizza, I don't know, I was gonna say something that would make the cops concerned, and I feel like I've done that enough, so like, let's not have serial killers hand me my pizza, okay? But you know what, good good job, Zombani Creations on Twitter, okay? But like, why? Why'd you do this to me? And finally, in a number one, Purple Guy. While Purple Guy, again, isn't an animatronic, and I guess neither is Glitch Trap or Vanny, but you know what, I had to pat out this list somehow. I think seeing some dude dressed in purple delivering me my freaking Freddy Fazbear branded pizza would actually scare me to death. Like, I don't wear purple on this channel anymore because people kept calling me the purple guy and the, the cops don't need any more ammunition against me, but also because I can't actually <laughs> find that shirt at the moment. But, but still, this is something that I would absolutely do. If I had a car, I honestly might have actually delivered food for the Freddy Fazbear's pizza delivery service if it ends up opening in Canada. And you know damn well that if I was doing it, I would be dressing in all purple with a security badge on my chest, maybe even like a purple phone case for the occasion just because it would be hilarious. Okay, I don't need a spring lock crank, those aren't actually a thing in real life. While the term spring lock is used in real life, it's a totally different mechanism from what's actually in FNAF, okay? I'm certain most of you get the whole spring locks are real line from the spring locks in you how to not die remastered thread from the FNAF wiki. However, actual spring locks are just locks that use spring. Like, from my research, what I gathered was that a spring lock in real life is in simplest terms if your front door's deadbolt was on a spring. Every other instance talking about real spring locks is just, it simply brings you to that page or it quotes that page. Um, so yeah, spring locks as they're used in the games do not exist in real life. Okay, the term is used but in the real life it's two separate words instead of one and they are nowhere close to the same thing. And 10 mini arenas. Why are the mini arenas so damn creepy? <laughs> like, they're not scary per se, but they literally tear Ballora to pieces, so that's something, at least. Like, the mini arenas are basically the robotic version of those kids, like in your neighborhood that are always screaming or causing trouble at all hours of the day. And like, you know, they go to a nearby school so that you literally always have to deal with them no matter what. Or they run down the street when you knock on their door to see their older brother and then their family is so damn lazy that you have to take off after him running down the street and, and after him because his family's not gonna do anything even though it's literally a toddler running down the street nothing but a diaper at 11 in the morning. Then you catch him in front of your other friend's house and then you end up having that kid pull your hair, kicking and punching you all the way back to his house. At least he wasn't screaming because then you might have gotten arrested. Uh, then they don't even thank you. Did I just say all that out loud? Okay, well, my old neighbors were trash. Okay, it's, that's a story for another day. But that's what the mini arenas remind me of, except they can kill me or stuff themselves into my body while I sleep in order to escape their underground storage facility. And uh, I, don't, I don't think that kid was gonna do that. Hit at nine, Circus Baby. 
Let's move on to one of the deadliest animatronics in the game. Baby has a on-screen death count of two. The first being William's daughter Elizabeth, and then the other being Henry as we see in FNAF World. But it's not just the ability to kill that's crazy, it's the incredibly advanced technology present inside this animatronic that's impressive. The ability to contain a whole child grabbing claw, and then also a containment chamber for said child is pretty damn impressive, but also the ability to use pins on her body to change her appearance is also pretty nuts. Not to mention all of her other features like ice cream dispensing and balloons inflating at her fingertips. But all of this again is overshadowed by the absolute carnage Baby has the ability to wreak. Ah, dare I say, let there be carnage. And honestly, that's probably just the tip of the iceberg for the animatronic, not even including the Fazbear Frights versions. And I know that this isn't a Minecraft video, but did you know that only 14% of people who watch these videos are actually subscribed? You could be watching our videos all the time and not actually know that you're not subscribed. So, if you do like these kinds of videos, hit the subscribe button. It's free, it helps us out a whole lot, and you can always unsubscribe if you want to, okay? It's not like a, it's not like a marriage, okay? We don't get half your stuff if you choose to unsubscribe. Okay, now, on with the video. And it ate the scooper. Now, I, I know you may be mad and think that this is like a stupid point, but like, hear me out, okay? The scooper may seem like a weird but kind of normal thing, at least by FNAF standards at first, but with the blueprint revealing how this actually works, this thing is an incredible piece of technology. It can inject whatever it ends up scooping with Remnant, a molten metal possessed by souls that is capable of keeping a person alive after removing their insides, as we see with Michael. Replacing it because you know he gets his innards replaced with innards and then like you know is able to walk around and then after those robotic parts leave his body He can still just chill in essence making him just a walking case of flesh Unless it didn't actually remove anything and instead just opened him up and then had the animatronics go around his bones But that, that's that that would still require some serious juice to keep alive and that's pretty damn impressive But also horrifying because while he may look more like he's just bruising if the purple on Michael's skin is actually decay like some suggest That remnant injector is actually able to animate a dead corpse in essence creating zombies Which would then start a zombie apocalypse and that's been done to death no pun intended so you should all understand how bad of an idea that is, okay? Zombie apocalypses generally aren't good, especially animatronic-fueled zombie apocalypses created by intense agony-possessed metal that gets injected into someone's no-no square. And it's seven nightmare animatronics. While not the epitome of horror, the Nightmare animatronics are certainly not the nicest of fellows. Not only that, but they are in fact not real. They're supposed to be in your brain, which makes them even more terrifying if you ask me. Because not only do these like illusions cause horrific visions to anyone who knows about them, they also end up killing a coma patient. Crying Child, as we know, is in the hospital in FNAF 4, making this game just a nightmare. However, getting caught by one of these animatronics causes him so much stress that he actually dies, which is absolutely insane when you look at it like that. These are so scary to him that it gives him a legit heart attack or just makes his heart stop working entirely. Since we know that's what happens instead of brain death at the end of the game thanks to the flatline at the end, which is horrible and incredibly sad but also terrifying. And it's six, the twisted ones. Well, the twisted ones do certainly seem to live up to their name. The twisted animatronics are these horribly disfigured creatures that get no love from their mother unlike an ugly duckling. The thing is, these don't grow into swans. Instead, they use another bit of tech that'll, that I'll get into later to disguise themselves. They also dig deep into the ground and wait until the middle of the night to crawl out and then take kids who wander away from their mommies. This legit sounds like some urban legend that parents tell their kids to make sure they stay home or get home after dark. I mean, I don't really know what else to say about them. That's the way the news goes. How about through in number five, Fetch. Fetch was introduced in the Fazbear Frights books and is a robotic dog made by Fazbear Inc. that gets a little too loving. So much so that it will actually brutally murder the girl you ask to homecoming, even though her dad is a supervillain. Uh, sorry, Peter, but at least you won't have to feel bad about sending your dad to prison. Either way, a robotic dog that will kill anything you love is absolutely terrifying and should be taken care of as soon as possible. Like, this is why you spay and neuter your animals, people. That's why the price is right would always say that. But in all seriousness, could you imagine if this thing was real? Like, if you randomly started getting texts from a robotic dog that followed you home, that instead of bringing you dead birds or squirrels, instead brings you the bloody arm of your crush. That sounds like something the Winchesters would end up fighting after it was manifested by some, like, seven-year-old. <laughs> oh, that, that would, yeah. 
it's it's like how they find a body in one of those crime shows, like Bones, and they're like, oh, this robotic dog just found this rotting arm and then put it in my bed. Like, that's like Palant levels of crazy, and if you know, you know. In it for Lonely Freddy. Lonely Freddy already, in a way, has a parallel in our world. Well, kind of. Like that trope where someone becomes your friend and then becomes more like you and then tries taking over your life. I feel like that's a thing, but maybe, maybe I dreamt that ages ago and forgot about it, but I mean, it's, it's possible, but also just plain old identity theft is another version of Freddy, okay? Identity theft isn't a joke, Jim. A Lonely Freddy was introduced in the Fazbear Frights books and is basically meant to explain what psychic friend Fredbear is, but a robot that steals your body and then traps your consciousness into its original robot body. What the ever-loving hell? Why is that so goddamn terrifying, especially in concept? But what if it was actually a thing? Well, it's easy to say that we would just try to avoid them, but we wouldn't know that they exist. We would just be lonely kids dreaming about having friends and someone who doesn't hurt you when all of a sudden a robot wants to be our friend. It would be vicious and, and definitely would have gotten me when I was a kid, hell, it could have it, it could get me now. Like I legit re wanted a robot friend because they wouldn't end up turning on me or something like that. And then here we go. Here's this. I, j I just wanted someone to play games with. And if those people ended up not being people but instead robots, I would have been fine with it. That would have been fine with me. Except these would have taken over my body, so that would have kind of been a bummer. <laughs> but that begs the question: When you get put inside the Lonely Freddy, would you then get the ability to take over another person's body, or would you just be trapped in there permanently? Either way, it's terrifying, but I just, I want to know. Getting close to the end, and in number three, human robots. This is something I'm sure people won't think is scary, okay? Some, uh, scary good, maybe, but hey, the fact that there are robots that are actually able to look like humans is terrifying. Like, that's such a, a scary thing. In the original FNAF novel trilogy, it's revealed that Charlotte, the main protagonist of the books, is in fact one in a series of four robots meant to allow her to grow up properly after being killed at an early age. But not only is she a robot, also apparently she's also a baby. At least from what I remember reading about the books, Charlotte's robot was also able to look like baby thanks to the pins on her body that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, that is the epitome of horror. Who in their right mind would think of a concept like that? And then, what if it was real? Like, we would all be goners. Like, imagine the fembots from Austin Powers. That's basically this. And then all the down bads would be trying to give it to them, and then they'd get themselves scooped. I'm surprised it didn't happen in the actual novels, since that one guy had his, um, had his gears turning, if you know what I mean. And if you do, can you please explain it to me, because I'm not even quite sure what I said there. And ultimately, in at number two, the spring locks. The spring lock mechanisms is probably the most intuitive thing that FNAF World's invented. The ability to move robotic parts out of the way enough for a human to fit inside is insane, and while it may be dangerous, we also drive over 100 kilometers per hour in huge metal death boxes, so can we really complain? Uh, yes, yes we can. Because while yes, cars have their faults, they are nothing compared to the ability to be both animatronic and suit. And then, like, that's an incredible feat of technology. People keep saying that spring locks actually exist in the comments, and I don't, I don't think that's true, okay? You, no one has ever given me a source, and I just, it, it's not a thing, okay? Yet, these are also terrifying because of the same reasons in game. Someone can dress in it and pretend to be a robot, and then anything, everything can clamp down on you in any second, as it has multiple times before. It can trap you, okay? It, it, it could, if it were real, crush you and do everything that we learn about from the books and the games, okay? It would basically just make your life hell for fun, especially when it can be a robot, and the man who was once inside of it can smile knowing that you and all your friends can't fight off a huge hunk of metal. But also, like, I would never get into one of those things. Like, even if there hadn't been an incident that just, that seems like a final destination moment. I don't, I wouldn't do it, even if it's in my contract. If they tell me, get in this or you're fired, I quit. Like, God. Or actually, no, I let them fire me so I get a severance package. If they have one. And then I can sue them for wrongful, for wrongful termination. And finally, in number one, the Illusion Sound Discs. I used to mention these a lot, at the very least, because these are astounding. If you didn't already know, in the original FNAF novel trilogy, it was revealed that the Twisted One's animatronics used discs that changed how others saw them, basically creating an illusionary appearance using sound emitted from that disc that messed with your brainwaves. However, the mere existence of these discs puts everything we know about the series into question. Like, how do we know that anything is real? FNAF 1 has us hallucinate multiple different things, like it's me, along with multiple news clips 
clippings and posters. What if that was all the discs? And if it was, what if other things were changed by the discs as well? Like, what does the pizzeria really look like? Do the animatronics have different appearances than what we actually see? Are they more rotten? And given that they were leaking mucus and blood beforehand, I feel like they should have been decommissioned. But if this technology existed, I would have trust issues even more so than I do now. Honestly, this might exist, and we just we just don't know about it. Disney is probably using it because they're like the evil corporation of the world, right? That's a thing. Is that we're never getting sponsored by Disney, but that's fine. <laughs> Firstly, location, 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 right? The obvious answer here is to go with the closed Chuck E. Cheese location. Chuck E. Cheese recently has closed 34 locations across the U.S. with locations closing in California, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Iowa, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, Nevada, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, South Carolina. Carolina, South Dakota, Texas, Utah, Virginia, and Wisconsin. So any of these locations could be used as a potential first location at the very least, with some states having multiple closures. Buying one of these locations would be expensive, and online I couldn't find any real reports on how much it would be. You'd have to work that out with Chuck E. Cheese. However, to open and operate a Chuck E. Cheese location would range from $1.17 million to $1.83 million, with a franchise fee of $800,000, according to Chuck E. Cheese's section of FranchiseHelp.com. So assuming the higher end of the price range, this would require an investment of around $2.63 million. Not taking into account that these locations are closed and they're probably just looking to break even on it and maybe not make money. But which state should we be selecting? Well, looking on Google Trends, we can actually see what states search for Five Nights at Freddy's the most. Looking for the search term Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, since, you know, that would be the name of the location, we see Virginia searching it the most over the past 12 months, as of April 2021, followed by Florida, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Texas in that order. Comparing that to our list of states, Virginia is the state with the highest search and has a close location in Fredericksburg. And I don't know about you, but the fact that it's in Fredericksburg, you know, like Freddy, that seems like fate to me. But there is also the thought of Florida, who is the second most searched and is only slightly less searched, so like it's like a close second, and has multiple Chuck E. Cheese restaurants closed, located in Miami, North Lauderdale, Miami Gardens, and Green Acres. So there is room for expansion. Florida is also a popular tourist spot thanks to the Disney Park in Orlando where I would go with my family. I think we've went like two or three times. So it's probably a better idea to go with Florida's Miami location, even though Orlando and Miami aren't really that close, but it's still centralized, okay? And everything's open in Florida, so you can start work on it right away. So the Miami Chuck E. Cheese location is the first one to be bought by Scott Cawthon. What would it look like? Well, many fan creations always make it appear the same as just a normal Chuck E. Cheese, but replacing the logo and text. Probably the most famous one being the image used in MatPat's old FNAF theories. But we could take this one step further. Since the inside of the restaurant is already seen in game, we can take that same design concept and just convert it to real life. I feel like that's pretty obvious. With the red and black squares along the wall, potentially outlined with additional decoration, you would also need to either replace or repaint the tables and booths and stuff like that, along with replacing the posters on the wall and the banners hanging above. The purple would also be changed to another color, most likely red, or maybe Maybe more of the red and black square pattern we see along the walls in the first couple games. The animatronics, if included, could easily be updated with Freddy, Chica, and Bonnie designs. Well, I mean like easy in comparison to everything else that needs to be done. And once that's done, you just need to replace the songs that play out of the speakers and then boom, you got working stage shows. I don't know if Foxy would need to have his own section or if you'd want to like add that off off to the side or if you want to use the the kind of like separate stage that's on some of the Chuck E. Cheese stages. I don't know, it depends on the location, if it actually has one. But other than that, that's just more construction work. Now, what makes this different than your typical kids play joint, you ask? Well, it does actually have the FNAF characters, not infringing on copyright because Scott would be doing this all himself. There is another aspect of the place that I think would make this even more unique and bring in more sales. FNAF is a horror franchise after all, and for some reason a whole load of these kids love being scared crapless by the many animatronics. So uh, why shouldn't this location offer a spooky surprise for anyone willing to come after dark? 
Much like how Security Breach will have a day and night cycle, why not let the restaurants have the same? Where instead of closing at 9 p.m., they swap to a creepy and horror themed joint where the kids can come to get scared while eating pizza and playing games. You know, the lights can flicker, you have people dressed up. Like a year round haunted house. We could even get some of the games we see in Pizzeria Simulator, like Fruity Maze and Midnight Motorist, in real physical arcade machines. All you need is a TV monitor. People do it all the time on YouTube. It would actually be an incredible idea that would suck in a lot more people and increase profits late into the night. This also works for adults who are fans of the series, who may not want to deal with the children and the kid-friendly atmosphere that the location would have during the day. This time frame would feature actors in the FNAF suits, but not Springlock suits because, well, <laughs> we all know how that ends. But this would be just like a Halloween haunt for our Canadian friends or whatever Disney does. It's like Halloween Horror Nights or whatever it's called over there. People in costumes who can't touch but aim to scare, maybe jiggling some doors or hiring actors working as kids or patrons who get lured away, maybe even make making a Nightmare Fredbear suit. There is so much that you can do. Oh, you can have like Foxy slowly peek out from behind it unless someone like looks or something like that. You can have him slowly peek out and then you can, oh. Eventually, of course, you could expand, opening more Fazbear locations at the other closed Chuck E. Cheese's. And I feel like Chuck E. Cheese would be down for that too, because the resulting competition could help boost their sales as well, since there would be kids who don't want to go to a horror-themed joint at night, but have a newly ignited or rediscovered joy for pizzeria arcades and animatronic bands. And hell, even as a joke, you could open up Chica's Party World, because you all we all know that Scott's gonna have some form of, like, ARG with these locations if this is actually a thing. Scott, I have an idea for that too. Hit me up. The menu would serve pizza, obviously, but also themed meals, like Chica's chicken wings or Bonnie's breakfast for dinner, since, you know, eggs. Maybe Foxy's flapjacks? It will definitely use a little work, but I'm honestly thinking it would taste and look incredible, both the menu and the food respectively. I have a design in mind, but let's be honest, I can't show my whole hand, can I? No, I actually gotta leave some stuff to actually hopefully make this a thing. So, uh, cause you know, if there's some mystery, Scott might actually like, you know, cause we all know how he loves mystery. The menu is simple, since it's on a monitor and needs to be seen at a distance, with a red border and simple sans serif text describing the various dishes and listing prices, with images of the dishes of the four major characters on each of the screens. Freddy's Pizza, Chica's Chicken Wings, Bonnie's Breakfast for Dinner, and Foxy's Ultimate Nachos. I was going to do Ultimate Fries, but kids are going to find nachos more exciting than fries, even if the whole alliteration thing makes sense. And while the horror events are focused on adults, the majority of the fan base and patrons are going to be children. Hopefully not missing ones. Obviously, you can also offer alcoholic beverages like beer and perhaps margaritas for the parents of the kids during the day and all the adults that will be coming in during the horror nights. More on that later. But other than that, it's a fairly straightforward menu. The menu has to be simple for the kids and anyone looking from a distance. And this is the kind of stuff I actually went to school for. <laughs> I went over the interior design in the last part briefly, but only offered ideas instead of actually providing examples. So let's do that. Like I said last time, I think the purple sections of the wall should be replaced with red and black squares like we see in the original maps. And the white and black squares with the red outlines on the walls should go around the joint as well. We've seen the interior in the first few games, so we might as well just recreate something similar. The booths could just be repainted, or they could be separated into sections based on what animatronic is your favorite. Same with the party tables, with sections for Foxy, Bonnie, Chica, and Freddy, with posters for each character indicating those sections, as well as banners to indicate it overhead so you can see it at a glance. The stage may come with a separate section for Foxy known as the Galaxy Stage for Chuck E. Cheese, which would easily be converted into Pirate's Cove, it's already a circle, you just put up a curtain. The arcade is probably the biggest reason anyone went to Chuck E. Cheese, the second being the recycled pizza conspiracy, and the third being because of the characters. However, the kids this time around will be coming for the FNAF characters and be staying for the arcade. The arcade could be filled with the normal games we see at normal Chuck E. Cheese's. Skee-ball, whack-a-mole, basketball, knock-a-clown, all the rest. However, the biggest showstoppers could be FNAF-themed versions of these games. Whack-a-mole could be whack a mini Rena, and Knock-a-Clown, you know, the one where you like throw the balls at the clown or like you throw them at its teeth, could be Popping Balloon Boy's balloons. There could be a photo booth that puts a nightmare animatronic or spring trap behind the people in the booth for a real scare, and you could include custom games like Fruity Maze, Midnight Motorist, and Security Puppet. There are plenty of people who've made their own arcade cabinets. Take this one from the YouTube channel I Like To Make Stuff. Bob does an incredible job. 
and all Scott would really need to do is code full versions of these games. Oh no, a game dev having to code new games, so difficult. Actually, not even new games, games that he's already made, just full versions. The games would be incredibly popular and would result in high revenue since they wouldn't really provide tickets, so they'd just be spending coins to play real FNAF games, but getting nothing other than that in return so your prize counter doesn't lose anything. This is how the businesses think. They could also make machines for arcade versions of the original FNAF games, maybe having buttons that flip through cameras and you need to find Foxy before he gets to you or something along those lines. The prize counter could have a real version of the FNAF puppet box there, playing its signature music to provide a reason for why it's still closed. However, this could potentially be opened at night during the horror nights. If not, the person working at the prize counter could simply be dressed like the puppet. The prize counter could offer things similar to the one from Help Wanted, and offering signature items such as stuffed baskets of exotic butters, which have already been made by Funko. They could also offer FNAF Funko Pop figures, with rarer ones being valued higher as well as potentially Switch and console versions of the games, along with the smaller prizes that are just meant to keep people from getting the big prizes by saving up. You know, the kids will impulse buy them. That's why they're there. This could also feature recreations of things like the Lore Keeper Ending Certificate, which you could potentially get by presenting something given to you after beating all three of the FNAF 6 games. You know, the ones in the custom cabinets I mentioned. There is way more we can talk about this, trust me. Now, the Horror Nights are what I find the most interesting out of these new ideas, with maybe these happening once or twice a week instead of every night like I said last time, <laughs> thinking logistically and knowing that most people won't want to work all the nights. 9pm would be when they would normally close, so instead, how about closing for an hour while the team sets up for a special treat for all who dare to return? The restaurant could be lit with black lights, revealing blood stains on the wall along with handprints and maybe some text written in blood, or paint that shows up under a black light and not during the day. The lights in the bathrooms could be flickering and most of the arcade machines would be off, aside from any that make loud noises, distract well, or could scare you. Ski ball, basketball, balloon popping for example, as well as any custom ones like the FNAF 6 Lorekeeper minigames, or if any of the 8-bit minigames from FNAF 2 were recreated. Obviously they would include jump scares at the end. The food would be limited to whatever you wanted, probably taking away the breakfast for dinner, and you could have actors walking around in nightmare themed suits with the animatronics Electronics program to make sudden movements, since they need to move to keep their servos from locking up, but they can't really walk around. The music that plays could be replaced with atmospheric and scary themed music, like what we use for our videos, with periodic screams and maybe a couple faded door shakes and calls from Phone Guy, making sure that Scott Coffin makes an appearance in the first Freddy's location. This would be the first pizzeria to do something like this, as of my knowledge, and the possibilities are endless. It would be a great first date, as long as you're both into it, and it would increase profits tenfold, basically turning the place into a diet bar with horror elements. Keeping the place open until 2am when you have last call at 1 or 1.30, I don't know, I don't know how bars work, I turned 19 and then I didn't really go to bars and then the whole pandemic thing happened so I can't really go to bars now. Yeah, I don't know how bars work. So there's always been this desire from the community for a real Freddy Fazbear's, and it's been present since the first game, because for some reason, they all think that it's a good idea to have a restaurant whose fictional series is built around the murder of unknowing kids to have a real-world counterpart. And while I do believe that it would make an incredible amount of money, and it could be an outlet for Scott to divulge some more lore to us, there are plenty of sick people out there. So sick, in fact, that they might just want to recreate the games, and may just take the the role of William Afton. And plenty of people have said that they're willing to die at a real Freddy Fazbear's as long as they get to contribute to making the FNAF story real. And that's honestly probably why Scott has at one point said that he didn't want to make one. But is this really the case? Has Scott just ignored the massive opportunity he has in front of him in the form of a real Freddy Fazbear's? Well, maybe not, but it's definitely not going to happen anytime soon. Let me explain. We know how dedicated Scott is to dates, both in-game and IRL, when releasing or talking about his games. He released FNAF 2 87 days after the first, like how we were all focused on the bite of 87 from the first game. Any date that he has put in the series has been solid, and even if things are changing, he always stuck to the bite of 87 and the bite of 83. Dates have always been important to Scott. And as any fan of the series that has at least tried their hand at their own timeline can tell you, FNAF 3 takes place 30 years in the future. In fact, the events of FNAF 3 take place in around 2023. And while that's quite the coincidence in-game, because like 30 years in 2023, 
I don't know why I think there's a coincidence. I think just maybe because they both have threes. Anyway, the thought is that perhaps, while we may not get a real Freddy Fazbear's this year or the next, that 2023 is a possibility for when a real Freddy Fazbear's or even a real Fazbear Frights could open. I mean, if he started planning now, it would definitely take a while, right? Hell, maybe he's already started planning, but now he has to wait because of COVID or he's just planning on opening it up in 2023. And by Fazbear Frights, I mean the location of the third FNAF game, not the book series. And I mean, they are going to need a set for the upcoming FNAF movie, whenever it ends up going out. So maybe this is all just getting us prepared for a real FNAF. I mean, there was that Nicolas Cage FNAF movie ripoff that I'm sure was just a cash grab trying to capitalize on the FNAF movie hype before the actual FNAF movie came out. But could this be what Scott was planning from the beginning? Getting everyone hyped for the possibility of a real location or what a real location would look like in his mind with the movie and the books which expand on the lore. Cause he was planning to open one for 2023 at the same time that Fazbear Frights would have opened in the FNAF universe. It would make sense especially for Scott. And he's really running out of ways to give us more lore hints at this point. He's already released three full novels along with like nine books that all have three shorter stories inside. And those, and especially the Fazbear Frights books, yeah, don't think I didn't notice the name, all had insane lore clues that helped us distinguish parts of the series that we had been previously confused about. Like how William had survived being in a blocked off room for 30 years without food or water because he was possessed by a kid. It also explains how he survived the fire from FNAF 3 and FNAF 6, and how he managed to get a hard drive in order to possess it before FNAF VR, so it could get scanned into the game and then he would become basically immortal. But now we've seen source code being used as a clue, the names of photo files that we've had to access with notepad being a clue, audio files, voice actor listings, hell at one point I decoded the name of a color and how it relates to the Emily family as a clue. Not to mention the countless hours of searching through all the games and then the logbook and oh my god. And yet still nobody has figured out FNAF 4. There aren't many new things he could do to bring us innovative ways for hints. Unless that's what this place would be for. And he used this place as an ARG of sorts. Where you can get lore clues and maybe even some answers to things like FNAF 4. Or even who caused the bite of 87. So we can have a definitive answer instead of being stuck on either Mangle or Toy Chica or Golden Freddy. Hell, pull a WandaVision and base the series off a new decade each week so we can actually be there for the bite of 87 when it takes place and then gets shut down and then it reopens the next week as a new decade. Huh? And for those people saying Scott already said he wouldn't do it, first of all, People change their mind all the time, whether the reason is financial or not. And this place would be a huge success, especially after Chuck E. Cheese closed over like 30 locations. The timing couldn't be better at this point, honestly. The big problem with this is the danger. And while I'm sure Scott would have as many security measures as he could, we need to remember what the story of the games is. It's about kids dying in these restaurants, and by one of the creators of the restaurants, no less. I'm sure that Scott doesn't want to end up like Henry. These issues only heighten when you look at the discussions on this. I've seen comments on our videos talking about how they'd be happy to get dying, get stuffed inside of Freddy, and how they'd just be happy to die in Freddy Fazbear's. I'm not even going to make a joke about how you would rather want to be stuffed into Toy Chica. But also, the comments about how they want to kill someone in a FNAF location, or how they want someone to kill someone in a FNAF location, no or how they want someone to go missing and the story of the games to be real. Look, I know you guys love the game, okay? I love it too. The story is incredible and cryptic in all the best ways, but what the hell? Like comments from the last video talking about what could be in like a real FNAF. Someone had commented, bro, if this became a thing, I would want to get murdered so I can possess a suit. That would be so epic. Ah, uh, yes. No, it wouldn't be epic because you'd be dead. Possession isn't a real thing in the real world, okay? And even if it was, we don't know how it works. It's not like if there's a real world version of FNAF, that agony will be what determines you possessing something, okay? If possession was real, it wouldn't be something that simple, and so it wouldn't be something you can control. And at that point, if you want to be murdered, it's not murder. Yeah, it's self-assisted murder. Because, you know, if I say the actual word, YouTube's gonna flag this video. But that wouldn't cause you agony, you'd be happy to die. It wouldn't even work in, in the FNAF universe sense. But it's reasons like those that will ultimately get Scott to shut down this idea permanently. 
And even if they're meant as jokes, he probably wouldn't want to take the chance because, well, they may not all be jokes. And if anyone got hurt or worse because of something he opened, honestly, I don't think any of us would be able to forgive ourselves if we were the cause of that. Like if we were in Scott's shoes and we opened a Fazbear restaurant and then someone ended up getting killed because of the games and the restaurant, I wouldn't be able to handle that, I know that. Even for asking for it so much that he felt like he had to do it. So stop saying crazy shit like that. You know for a fact that you don't want to get killed at the place, even if it's what the original games do or whatever. That's not fun, it's not cool, don't say it. It won't help the situation. So if you really want a real FNAF, stop saying it so you can get killed there, okay? I can't believe that I had to say that.